Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can even earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Spotify for Podcasters has made our podcasting process so much easier and even has options like Q&As and polls so we can engage with listeners. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. The following contains descriptions of physical violence, sexual violence, and graphic descriptions of autopsies. Hey listeners, welcome to episode 49 of TGIC Podcast. I'm Jillian. And I'm Izzy. So, since our last episode, we have actually launched our second podcast, Toxic Positivity. That's a fun sound you keep making. I know, I don't know why I'm making that, I'm sorry. If this is your first episode and you're just, this is what you're getting greeted with. The first two episodes are out now on all platforms, and our third episode will be out on March 11th. (laughs) Woop Okay, anyway, go check it out. Um, it's, it's on all platforms now, and we have our first two episodes. One's, like, getting to know us, and then the other one, we just, like, make fun of each other's social anxiety issues. Yeah. So that's pretty funny-ish. Um, <laughs> yeah, so go check it out, uh, Toxic Positivity, and you can follow us on Instagram at toxicpositivity.podcast. Anyway, today we will be covering a case recommended by a listener named Lily, so thank you, Lily, for the recommendation. Uh, remember, you can recommend a case by filling out the form that we have linked on Instagram and on our website, or you can just, like, send us an email. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, whatever. We love getting your case recommendations, and sometimes we get really interesting case recommendations from listeners, so that's kind of what we're doing today. Um, yeah. Yeah. Today we will be covering the Boy in the Box murder, so let's go ahead and get started. So, the Boy in the Box is also known as America's Unknown Child and the Fox Chase Boy, and he is an young American John Doe victim from the 1950s. He was found in Fox Chase, the Fox Chase area in this like park of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania on February 25th of 1957. He was found wrapped in a plaid blanket and in a cardboard box. Oh. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is like a really sad case, but also some of the theories are really interesting, so mm-hmm. I feel a little bit bad about being interested, but um, it's really sad. Yeah. Yeah. He is estimated to be between three and seven years old. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. He was white, three feet to three feet and three inches tall. He weighed roughly around 30 pounds. Oh, angel number 3333. Yeah, actually, wait, that's so weird. Um, Sorry, that was like a really inappropriate time to be I mean, yeah, but it's an angel number. Um, But the boy in the box was actually, he most likely came from a poor family life just because he had signs of abuse and he was also very clearly malnourished like, like I said he was roughly 30 pounds and that's like nothing yeah for the kid his age all right so I'm gonna do just a really brief timeline about how his body was discovered and then Izzy's gonna go a little bit more in depth about the investigation um so his body has like a weird little story about being discovered and it's like I don't it was like three times discovered basically yeah okay so in February of 1957, a young muskrat hunter. I'm sorry, I need a minute to make fun of a muskrat hunter. What is a muskrat? I actually don't know. Should we Google it? A muskrat? Muskrat. A muskrat. Like Elon Muskrat. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, please look up a picture of a muskrat. It looks please. like a weird little hamster human thing. Oh my god. They're kind of cute. I wouldn't want to kill one. Those things are not cute. Oh my god, it's tail. What the fuck? It's like descended from the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> like it looks like a weird gerbil fish. It's eating a piece of bread. What is parrot? His hands are so realistic. What is realistic? A oh, he's a palaplatypus. A palaplatypus. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, um, a young muskrat hunter named John <laughs> Stachowiak um, <laughs> discovered the boy in the box. <laughs> The forest. Sorry, I'm still having the muskrat thing. Can you tell that we were having a conversation for like two hours before this? Yeah, we literally could not bring ourselves yeah. to record today because we were having our own private conversation. Okay. Um. Anyway, February 1957, a young muskrat hunter named John Statuayak discovered the boy in the box in the forest where he was hunting. 
But at the time, he chose not to report it because he was concerned that the police would confiscate his traps. <laughs> what a selfish <laughs> <No>. muskrat hunter! <laughs> I know, it's so mean. It's like, oh yeah, I found this dead, abused body of a little boy, but instead of reporting it, I'm going to protect my, my traps. Lord. <laughs> he's like Fred from he's like Scooby Doo. Oh, Muskrat, my Muskrat, you gotta protect him. <laughs> Actually, I gotta kill him. Keep my traps in tow. My traps. My traps. Um. Anyways. Anyway, yeah. February twenty fifth of nineteen fifty seven rolls around, and a college student named Frederick J. Bananis discovered the boy in the box in the woods for the second time. Um, he had seen a bunny who ran into the woods and decided to make sure it was okay because he knew there were traps in there. What? Yeah, this is the most obscure story ever. I did not That is it so, a bit. so you're like, okay, I think there's traps in there. This bunny who's fine, I'm going to chase <laughs> after him. Make sure he doesn't get in a trap. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't report the body until a few days later because he was actually scared of the police and it was later discovered that he'd actually been in the area spying on students at a nearby school. So he didn't want to talk to the police. What a fucking creep. Yeah, seriously. Like, I'm not going to say he's involved in this murder or anything, but, like, he's such a fucking creep and a weirdo. Like, I went to go make sure the bunny was okay after, you know, keeping an eye on students. Yeah. Like, he's like a pedophile who cares about bunnies? What is this? Yeah, what? Um, so a few days later, he heard about this missing girl that was in the area, and then he decided to report the body because he was like, oh, well, what if I discovered her in the woods and I was chasing after that bunny? And it turns out it wasn't her because, you know, the boy in the box was a boy. Um, yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> but, um, yeah, so basically, this is how the body was discovered and eventually reported. But I feel like he was, must have been in there for a long time. I don't know how no one else came across it. Like, Yeah, like, he must have two... gone far into the woods or something. No, I mean, I'm not even thinking that. I'm just thinking that these are the only two people that came forward. was like, yeah, I discovered it and decided not to report it. Like, I'm sure there was probably other, other people. people. Other people. Because like, this was the, hunters. what, the 40s, 50s? 50s. Like, yeah, you like, never know. I'm just saying, like, that's a long time for a body to be just, like, hanging out in the forest where clearly, like, people go, like, hunters and stuff and, like, you know, people who care about bunnies. Yeah. And, you know, I just feel like it would have been discovered sooner and maybe yeah. just no one wanted to report it. Well, that just makes me sad. Like, yeah, it's really sad. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to get into the investigation, and before we get into the deep stuff, I'm going to lighten your mood. I was researching this during class, and there were autopsy photos all over the internet. I looked like a psychopath. I love to Literally. hear when Izzy looks like a psychopath at school. What class were you when we were doing this research? I was in bio. Mm, all bad things happen in bio. All bad things happen. Listen to talk to positivity <laughs> to hear about that. Anyways, yeah, so that was... Anyways... So, when the boy was actually found, there was some contradictory and notable information about his appearance. So, he was, like, pretty clean, and he had just gotten a haircut, and his fingernails were trimmed. And it's actually possible that his hair was cut post-mortem or just around his death, because chunks of his hair were actually found clinging to his body. Yeah, and it was also noted that he had this, like, unprofessional haircut. Yeah, like, it looked it looked kind of botched. Yeah, like, someone just, like, took a knife to his hair. yeah. And he was severely malnourished, like Jillian had said, and he actually had specific surgery scars, like, all over his body, but specifically on his chin, his groin area, and his ankle, and multiple of them were really well, multiple of which were really well healed, almost, like, to the point where it was hard to distinguish them, meaning that they're most likely done by a professional, Mm -hmm. like, just saying, going to the fact- And they were old. Yeah. And he- In his autopsy, there were multiple things that were confirmed by medical examiner. So, first off, his hands and feet were really swollen and wrinkled, and it's actually indicative of the fact that he was most likely in water prior or during his death, which is interesting, to say the least. But it's not noted that he, like, drowned to death. Yeah. He was just in water He was just in water for some reason. So, residue... That was discovered in his esophagus also suggests that he vomited prior to his death. And his cause of death was actually proven to be blunt force trauma, as seen from the four round-shaped bruises on his forehead and the fact that, like, the blood in his face was drained. So, just, like, a bunch of contradictory stuff. Because, like, if he was in the water, he was then moved to the box with the blanket... Like, when was his hair cut? The one thing that adds up for me, though, is um, I think a lot of times, like, with the blunt force trauma, like, when kids are abused, I think it's, like, fairly common for them to also throw up as, like, a response. Yeah. So uh, that does match. It's the water thing that's really off-putting. Yeah, the water thing is just, yeah, I don't know. 
And through x-ray, actually, um, by the medical examiner, he concluded that um, the boy had suffered from arrested growth, which was obviously due to malnourishment and abuse. What does arrested growth mean, that he stopped growing? So it just means that, like, his bones, like, he was, like, there was, like, a pretty big age range put on him. And I think the oldest age I said was potentially seven. And to be three feet tall at... yeah. And 30 pounds, like, it just means that his growing was slowed to the point where he was, like, indistinguishable what his age was. Yeah. And following the conduction of the autopsy, the police actually took his fingerprints and his footprints in hopes that he would be matched and his identity would be revealed. And I think at the time they were still doing fingerprints and footprints when you're first born. So, like, that was, like, in hospital records. And... Actually, the process didn't pan out, and this was actually what led the police to assume that he was not born in a hospital, because they couldn't find any records matching his, like, uh, finger and footprints. Do they do that anymore? I don't think so. But now I think about it, I feel like I have, like, a footprint in, like, a baby book somewhere from when I was born. Yeah, maybe. But maybe that was something my parents did, like, on their own. I don't really know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and the crime scene itself was actually searched extensively, but no solid evidence or information was ever recovered, and all that was really found at the scene was some of the boys' clothes, which weren't helpful since they were pretty generic, and the blanket that was on top of him, and they just determined that it was made of cheap cloth. Helpful. (laughs) Yeah, and following the initial investigation, um, actually 270 police recruits combed the crime scene extensively and also recovered a men's blue corduroy hat and a white handkerchief hat. hat. <laughs> what did I say? Hat. Hat. You said you they found a blue corduroy hat. <laughs> hat. Hat with an H. <laughs> Girl. And a white handkerchief adorned with the letter G in the corner. Okay, but like how do we know this is connected or it's not just like some muskrat hunters? Well you don't. Okay. <laughs> That's just what they found. Okay. So, following the start of the investigation, over 400,000 posters were printed by the Philadelphia Inquirer with, like, details about the little boy and pictures of him in hopes to gain some information on identific- identification. Jesus. Identification. But nothing was ever found. So, it's just sad. Yeah. And he's still never been identified. No. All right. So, I'm going to get into the theories a little bit. So, our first theory was, like, the earliest to kind of emerge in this case, and um, I'm not, I'm going to say in my opinion, it actually might be the most, like, reliable, but police mm-hmm. said no. Oh. Um, I find it to be the most reliable theory, but... But um, what have we ever gone with the most reliable theory on this podcast? Okay, I'm just saying, I think this one makes more sense. I'll explain in a minute. Okay, so, an early theme that emerged, what... This early theory emerged. I don't know why I said theme. I've been doing too much lit work. Yeah, I was about to say. Um, Yeah, I probably was switching between this and lit homework, so my bad. Um, An early theory emerged when a psychic actually suggested to a medical examiner that the boy had come from a local foster home, which is kind of nuts to begin with. The psychic suggested to... A police officer? No, it was someone who worked in the medical examiner's office. What? It wasn't even the medical examiner himself. It was just someone who worked in the office. I'm like, okay. So he, he calls up and he's like, hey, I think I know that this boy came from a local foster home. And anyway, like, wow, thanks for that. There's actually this local foster home that was located one and a half miles away from where the body was found. And it was run by Arthur and Catherine Nicoletti and Catherine's daughter from a previous marriage whose name was Anna Marie Nagel. So the theory kind of suggested that this boy was Anna's son. Ooh. And he had actually died accidentally, and they didn't want to expose her as an unwed mother, so they covered up the death. And also, like, a child abuser. Yeah, well, that too. Yeah, probably. That would make sense as well. But, um, also, I think the big deal was that she was, she was an unwed, un, unwed, unwed woman. Unwed Yeah. And she had, she had a child out of wedlock. <laughs> that, this is what I was getting. It was like, the theory was basically created by police, and they were like, oh, well, that, this is why she killed him. Yeah. Like, she not killed him, but it was an accident. She was, like, covered it up because... But, oh, Lord. um, there were some facts that actually substantiated this. Um, one of the officers went to this, like, open house at the foster home, and he was able to kind of, like, see some of the stuff they had lying around. Mm. So there was this, like, bassinet, like, the one that the box that the boy had been found in, so basically, there was this box that the mm-hmm. boy had been found in. It was a cardboard box, and it, 
was from like a bassinet at J.C. Penney. When the officer went to the foster home, he saw a bassinet that looked like this particular one. Ooh. Yeah, so that was kind of interesting. And then there were also these plaid blankets that were similar to the one that was wrapped around the boy on the clothesline outside. Ooh. But it was also the 50s, and I'm sure plenty of people had these, like, Walmart quality Exactly, like the bassinet thing, like, JCPenney. Or some, like, people get, like... Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people with the same shirts on at school, or, like, (laughs) whatever. Exactly. Um, and there was really no other evidence to substantiate this, and it was eventually ruled out, because it was just, like, there was no solid connection, it was all, like, circumstantial stuff. Mm -hmm. But I honestly find it really interesting. It is interesting. Because there's this foster home, it kind of makes sense to the whole, like, abuse and malnourishment thing, because, Mm -hmm. um, and it might not even be necessarily because they didn't, like, care, it was just could have been, like, something where, like, um, there were a lot of, like, mouths to feed, a lot of kids going around, and, like, I feel like foster homes are, like, mm, you know, they're never good. Like, places with a lot of kids living in the same area yeah. are just never good. So, I don't know, like, that's kind of something that, um, I was thinking that, like, kind of added up in a way. I don't know. Yeah. The psychic said so, is he? The psychic said so. The, si- the psychic said so. Okay, so I'm going to get on to a theory that's pretty limited, but I think it's interesting. Okay. So this is the man with the blue cap, <laughs> like not the, the yellow the, hat. Not the man with the magic hat? No, I'm the man with the blue cap. <laughs> <laughs> so, the hat that was found in the um, deep sweep by the police recruits, recruits harbor some story that we only know the beginning of, and here I will prove it. So, the hat itself was in near perfect condition and still had the manufacturer's label inside of it, which immediately sparked the interest of investigators. So, they knew where a hat was made? Yes. So, the lining read, Robin's Bald Eagle Cap, 2603 South 7th Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's just an address. Yeah. So, the police then went to the shop and questioned its owner, Hannah Robbins, though through questioning, they learned the hat had been custom-made with customizations for the man who bought it. Oh. Robbins believes that the man was between 26 and 30 and that he had blonde hair. But sadly, due to the fact that he paid cash and they had little conversation, the lead went nowhere. But, like, was this dude responsible for the murder? Was the boy his son? We may never know. Or was this just some guy who got some custom hat and then went to hunt some muskrats in the forest and then... Lost his hat. Lost his hat. You never know. It could have been a windy day. A windy day. <laughs> it could have been. Anyways, we're going to get on to our final theory. The M theory. I love this theory. The M theory. I think it's total bullshit, but I love it. <laughs> okay, so 40 years after the murder, in February of 2002, a woman under the pseudonym M came forward claiming that she had information about this case. So she said that in the summer of 1954, her br- mother had purchased a... wait. Purchased a young boy named Jonathan yeah. from his birth parents. She said that he was physically and sexually abused for years leading up to his death. And one night he threw up after dinner, which resulted in him getting beaten. And she said that after he was given a bath, he, which was when he died. Um, the ma- this matched unreleased details, including the fact that the autopsy said he had had baked beans in his stomach, which is what... She said they had had for dinner. That sounds like an abusive situation. Yeah. <laughs> Baked Jesus. beans? Baked beans for dinner? No. And his fingers were water wrinkled, which wasn't released at the time. And she also said that her mother cut his hair to make him unrecognizable, which matched with the unprofessional haircut he was found with. And she gave a story in which her mother and her had buried the body and were intercepted by a man in the process. And he was asking questions, but he eventually left. And this is actually corroborated by a witness account from 1957 in which a man insisted that he had seen the boy in the box. Yeah, like in the car. Yeah. So. But, (laughs) unfortunately, this theory was, like, eventually just dismissed because neighbors from the time insisted that no boy ever actually lived in the house. And this M person has, like, a really long history of mental illness. Oh, that's kind of sad, though. I know, but I don't understand. There's some, like, unreleased details that she got seriously right. Yeah, like the baked beans thing? Yeah, and matching up with a witness, like... Account? Account. Like, that's kind of nuts. Like, Like, what if the neighbor was just, like... Maybe the neighbor was involved, too, or something. Yeah, I don't know. Or maybe, I mean... 
was the neighbor even the same? I mean, I guess they had to track him down, but that seems like a lot of work. That does seem like a lot of... Being in the 1950s to yeah. 2002. Yeah, and tracking down who she lived next door to. Like, I don't... I don't know. I want to believe this theory. It sounds so legit. Yeah. But at the same time, I almost buy the foster home theory more. Yeah. What do you think? I really like the foster home theory. I think it makes the most sense, honestly. Yeah. Except for the fact that, okay, as much as, like, I understand, like, this abusive foster home system thing, Mm -hmm. he was her kid. So, like... Yeah. And they were running a foster home, so, like, I can't imagine that she would... If she was abusive to other kids, like, why her own? Why her own, and why did this go, like, unnoticed? Yeah, like, you'd think that there was people, especially, like, the officer went to an open house for the place, so it wasn't like there was, like, this weird closed-up foster home. Like, there were people going in and out of it and seeing what was happening there. Yeah. Like, I just, also, I feel like they couldn't have erased the boy's existence. Like, there had to be, you know, pictures, belongings. Exactly, like, like pictures of them at the foster home. Yeah, like, it's just, it's a little weird. It's, yeah, it's a little sketchy. But it does add up with the whole, like, no birth record in a hospital. Like, uh, that would make sense if you would be born in the foster home itself or something, you know? Yeah, exactly. This is, like, a nutty case. A nutty case. A nutty case. I like, I like John Doe cases and Jane Doe cases. They're really interesting. They're really sad, but they're also really interesting because there's this whole undiscovered part of Mm -hmm. the case. Plus, I love when they're solved. Exactly. It's so satisfying. It's so satisfying that there's finally this closure and, like, even though this terrible thing happened to them, that there's finally closure. Yeah. So I'm hoping that maybe that will happen for the boy in the box. Yes. Um, but yeah, this was the Boy in the Box case. Uh, tune in on the 31st for our 50th episode. We're taking a little bit of a break just because we have a busy March, but Mm -hmm. the 31st, 50th episode. Be there. Be there. The virtual world. It'll be awesome. It will not disappoint. The virtual world. You will listen to us. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, check out our other podcast, Toxic Positivity, and follow us on Instagram at tjc.podcast. Bye!